Welcome everyone. We'll go ahead and call this meeting of the El Centro City Council to order. At this time, if we could please have roll call by our city clerk. Council Member Cardenas? Present. Council Member Jackson? Here. Council Member Silva? Present. Mayor Pro Tem Garcia? Present. And Mayor Vegas Walker? Here. If you could all please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance and remain standing for our invocation. Please join me. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. If you guys can remain standing. Precious Lord Jesus, thank you again for this day, and we just ask that you continue to watch over our country, and you will continue to watch over our county and our city, Lord, and uh, again, we just ask for wisdom and guidance as uh, we do this work here in this city, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. Does our eagle have its chipped wing here, or is it just mine? No, it's been uh, like a hell off for you. Oh, oh he's right. Oh, okay. We've got it. You we need a, a yeah. wing fix up there. <laughs> All the best. Okay, so the uh, City Council met in closed session today from 11.30 till 1 o'clock, and we'd like now for our City Attorney to report out on closed session, please. Yes, Madam Mayor. In fact, um, I want to report out of closed session that based upon the outage, which continues um, for the charter slash spectrum cable system, the City Council has instructed me to file a formal complaint with the PUC. That complaint will be a two-part complaint. One will be a complaint for violation of their state franchise, and the other part of it will be a separate complaint for discrimination, which the FPPC specifically addresses, to um, commence uh, prosecution of all available remedies under the city ordinance to con to work with staff to contact our state representatives regarding the outage and um, to explore the provisions of state law which allow the city to consider a franchise abandoned based upon discrimination and seek other cable operators. Okay, so I'm gonna provide a little bit of um, interpretation for those of you that don't speak legalese. Mm -hmm. So some of us are really unhappy about spectrum cable and the fact that we can't get um, CBS and NBC and so far we've missed both the Super Bowl and most of the Olympics, except you can get a little bit of weird stuff if you go through a bunch of other things. So we've asked our city attorney to file a complaint with the PUC and um, Betsy has, and Ms. Martin has had an opportunity to speak with um, attorneys for the parent company, right? I spoke with John Fogarty, who's a charter attorney in Stamford, Connecticut this morning, and he did not express any willingness to work with the city um, at any level, although he was completely pleasant and businesslike. He pretty much said um, no. Yeah, sorry, I had to. <laughs> so it's kind of like a that is kind of like an I don't care type thing, and and we don't do well with I don't care. So the city attorney has been instructed to move forward with uh, filing a complaint with the PUC. City staff has been directed to please see if we can locate a different cable provider who would be interested in coming down um, to this area. And it is so fortunate that we actually have Assembly Member um, Garcia's. Uh, group in the house so you can deliver that message along with another wish. Here's a, here's the second thing on our wish list. We'd like to figure out how we can move forward with getting the armory cleaned up. The National Guard armory on 4th Street um, looks horrible. And what we've been told so far is that they can't mow the lawn because they don't own a lawnmower. So if we can get a liability waiver, we'll go in. <laughs> Jason Jackson, um, <coughs> We'll go in and personally mow it. I know some friends who have oh. some goats. We'd be happy to turn goats loose we'll on there. We'll fence it off, put goats in If there. you wouldn't mind just taking a, a drive-by tomorrow morning and taking a look at the armory and maybe there are some pictures, tell a thousand words and you can help us get that cleaned up. Actually, thank you. Madam no, Mayor, there, yes. um, a local resident um, that is a reservist has yes. actually taken it on as a private project. And he's actually cleaned it up pretty well um, the last three or four days. But I, I think long term, I, you know, they, they need to do something about it because yeah. we got them to clean it up once. Uh, code enforcement was on them. They cleaned it up one time and then they, they just didn't they let it go. So um, I don't expect a community member to be continuing that work forever. So they have to come up with some kind of idea with how to do that. 
Thank you. All right. Awesome. Okay, we are going to take one item out of order, and that is um, item number 14. Uh, this should take just a, a nanosecond, and we're uh, graced to have with us tonight from the El Centro Regional Medical Center, um, Tyler Salcido, and the presentation will be from our city manager, Marcella Piedra. If any of council members have any questions, uh, they can be directed to either um, Tyler or Marcella. Yes. Okay. Yes, good evening, um, mayor, members of the council. Um, this is actually an item that um, our, our mayor asked us to uh, visit um, based on a request that was made by El Centro Regional Medical Center, which is a change to the city ordinance related um, to a requirement to have a annual audit prepared by the hospital. Um, the hospital has asked for consideration to remove a section on ordinance, uh, section 1354, which required um, the hospital to provide a certified public accounting firm uh, with, uh, have them conduct an annual audit. Um, and uh, we're asking for consideration to have that removed. Um, as you know, we have a representative from the hospital which can indicate uh, maybe some of the other ways that they can provide financial information um, to the city. And of course, they're always uh, demonstrated a willingness to provide any kind of financial information that um, we may need from them um, and of course present to you any kind of report. I know uh, yeah. that I, yeah. we have two members of the council that are uh, that participate in, in meetings related to the hospital, so uh, I'm sure there's plenty of ways to get that information. So I think that we need uh -huh. to clarify that what we're asking for is a waiver of the mid-year report, right. not yes. the audit. Right. The hospital right. continues yep. to be audited every single year. It's yes. just that having that mid-year mm -hmm. um, costs the hospital mm -hmm. about three thousand dollars, five thousand mm -hmm. dollars, and. and we really felt that that was uh, unnecessary at this point in time, given that we have two members of the city council that sit and serve on the um, medical center board of trustees. We receive monthly financials. I sit on the finance committee. We share our financial information with everybody. It's a public agency. It's provided to our um, Ms. Salcido, our director of finance here. We've extended an invitation, as I understand it, for Ms. Salcido if she would like to attend any of our finance committee meetings or just be provided the information. Is there anything else that you'd like to add? Uh, I would just add uh, the, the AUP, uh, the mid-year review was concentrating mostly on our uh, accounts receivable, our bad debt allowance, and our contractuals, which um, we have always have outside sources or uh, agencies looking at that. UCSD, for example, came down and did a thorough review with us on it. and. Uh, commented that we're doing a real good job on that. And monthly we meet with them on monthly calls, <coughs> excuse me, to discuss all that too. So there's another oversight from, from the UCSD with our management agreement currently. So just it seemed that this would be a, is a redundant requirement and at $5,000 a pop, we think that the hospital can probably find other uses for that. So I would ask for favorable consideration of that mm -hmm. change. Madam Mayor, I'm very supportive of the uh, amended ordinance. I would just ask, do they typically give a mid-year mid a review to the trustees. We get we get monthly financials. I, I, yeah, okay. yeah monthly right. financials. There's so there's a finance committee meeting that then rolls to the full board of trustees on a monthly basis. So we have a motion by uh, Mr. Cardenas, a second by Mr. Silva, and that is adopted five zero. So thank you thank very you. much. Thank, thank you. Thank you for being and, here. And I appreciate pushing me up to the front. Not that it's not exciting to well, listen at all. We know you have a lot to do. We've got that huge strategic planning session for the hospital coming up yep. and lots to do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, let's move then on to something that uh, we're really excited about. And this is a presentation from Assembly Member uh, Garcia's office for our former police chief, Eddie Madueño. Whoa, that's huge. <laughs> Good evening, Madam Mayor, uh, members of the council, city manager, city attorney, members of the public. My name is Christian Nunez, and I represent Assemblymember Eduardo Garcia in the county of Imperial. Today is a very special day to us that we get to congratulate and commend former chief of police, um, Madueño, or Madueno, I don't know how to say it correctly. I apologize, but I have this resolution from Assemblymember Eduardo Garcia, and I'm going to read parts of it. 
him. If I can have him come forward, can I can I do that? Of course. <laughs> like, can I do that? Yeah. Okay. Uh, on the California Legislature of the Assembly, by the Honorable Eduardo Garcia on the 56th Assembly District, Police Chief Eddie Silva Madueño. Whereas the men and women who devote their time and energy to the duties of law enforcement service have assumed the responsibility essential to, for the safety of their community. And whereas the police chief, Eddie Silva Madueño of the City of El Centro has faithfully carried out his law enforcement responsibilities and continually demonstrated honesty, integrity, professionalism, and leadership in all of his varied assignments for more than three decades. And upon the occasion of his retirement, he is deserving of a special public recognition and the highest commendations. Whereas Chief Eddie Madueño has proven himself to be a gallant and dedicated officer who ep epitomizes the true character of the tremendously brave men and women who devote their time and energy to the perilous duties of law enforcement. Now, therefore, be it resolved by Assemblymember Eduardo Garcia that he takes immense pleasure in recognizing and thanking Police Chief Eddie Silva Madueño of the City of El Centro for providing the highest level of service and protection to his community and extends to him sincere best wishes for a rewarding and gratifying retirement. Members Resolution 190, dated on this 29th day of December of 2017 by Honorable Eduardo Garcia. Congratulations. So, Chief, how have you been? Well, thank you. Oh, thank you very much for the opportunity, and Assemblymember Eduardo Garcia sends his regards. Again, my name is Christian Nunez, and I represent Assemblymember Eduardo Garcia. You can find us at the Imperial County Airport at 1101 Airport Road Suite D, or at 760-355-8696. So thank you, and good evening. And happy belated happy birthday. Belated birthday. Uh, yeah, you're 18 yeah. now, right? Or? Uh, I'm 15. <laughs> <laughs> I thought maybe you were going to tell us about the Facebook page, too, or something. <laughs> no? Chief, how, how have you been? I've been fine. We've well, missed thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I've, it's been good. We thought you missed us, too. I, well, I did. I forgot did. you were getting out. I was just here by coincidence. It turns out I was getting there. <laughs> <laughs> but, but in all honesty, I, I want to thank Assemblymember uh, Garcia and his representative, uh, Mr. Nunez. Uh, thank the city and, and definitely uh, the men and women of the El Central Police Department. I think, as you know, I had a heck of a send-off um, from both the department and the city, so to come back tonight for this is just icing on the cake. So, um, you know, have fond memories of the city. Congratulations on a, on a great State of the City Thank address. You. Thank you. Um, you know, continue to follow that, but uh, I'm, I'm good with... Uh, no meetings and I'm look at back that. <laughs> you know, you you got this like relaxed look, yeah. this twinkle in your eye, and just like uh, still working for uh, Mr. Silva <laughs> by way of IVC. So yeah. teaching out there and spending time with my parents, my wife. So it's good. I was gonna say no. It, this would not be complete without recognizing the woman oh, behind the man. Come definitely. on up, my wife. Come Marge, on yeah. up, <laughs> yay! <laughs> So Margie, I'll ask you, how is it with him being retired? Um, <laughs> I love it. I love oh, it. Oh, good. Yeah, good, yeah. Good. The honey-do list is pretty long, <laughs> and it's still, you know, he's still working on it. So. Perfect. But Perfect. it's awesome. I didn't realize it was going to be as wonderful as it is, so it's nice. We're empty nesters, so. Wow. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, Madam Mayor, I think yes. I mentioned that the, one of the many celebrations that we had as we said goodbye to... Uh, to Eddie that um, how fortunate really uh, our IVC students in the police academy are to be learning from really one of the best, your, your experience, uh, your teaching methods, uh, Eddie, are something that are benefiting a you know, whole new crop of uh, law enforcement officers. And, and I'm so glad that you're a part of that. I uh, really mean that. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate you Thanks both very again. much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Chief. Okay, item number two, the introduction of the new officers, employees, excuse me, the new ECPD employees. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the council, city manager, staff, and public. 
So these are some of the, the few occasions that we're just very happy to come here. Uh, about a month ago, and actually uh, our former chief was able to sign off on, on the, the formal approval, but we were able to hire three new dispatchers. Okay. So I bring two of them with me today. The third one couldn't make it. I hope to bring her at the next city council meeting. But I have Ms. Denise Romero and Adriana Coronado. Uh, Ms. Romero is actually a Valley native, and uh, Ms. Coronado, my understanding, is a Valley transplant. I think she spent most of her... Uh, her adult life here. Uh, both of them are IVC alumni, and both of them come to us from the private sector. Uh, so they're, they're very much needed in our dispatch center, and from what we hear, we hear good things about them in their, so far in their training progress. So, lady, would you please come up? He told you you were gonna have to speak, right? Full speech. There, there we go. Okay, <laughs> who, want, who wants to go first? Okay. <laughs> Hello, I'm Adriana Coronado. Um, I previously worked for the Imperial County Veterans Service Office and for Behavioral Health. I'm engaged. I'm not really okay. quite sure what to say. <laughs> <laughs> I'm very informed. We just were told are you the something. native or you're the transplant? I'm the transplant, yeah. Where, where are you from originally? <laughs> um, I was born in San Bernardino, but my mom moved down here um, when I was almost two. Oh, so I, I grew up in Raleigh. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's, you're a native. That's yeah, right. native, yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. Okay, so you know our meetings are recorded, so your fiance is going to know that you gave us your past employment background and then <laughs> announced. And everything, oh, but okay. But you were saving the best for last, yes. is how you'll explain that. So, so have you spent some time working already, or how is that? Yes, a month so far. A month. Yeah. Yes. And so far so great? Yes. <laughs> Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Well, welcome. Hope you have a good career here and uh, enjoy working <laughs> for one of the the best law enforcement department in the county. Just welcome, and I, I think we'll have the other lady. Yes, there. Denise, yeah. right? Yes. Um, my name's Denise Romero, and I used to be a med medical assistant before I became a public safety oh, dispatcher. Wow. Mm -hmm. So it's uh, something different, but I like it. Denise, so. have, how much time have you spent over at A month, we started at the same time. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, very good. Yes. Yeah, just, or, no, I just, oh. just welcome to El Centro. I, I think uh, we always say the same kind of thing. You know, it's really we're all kind of with one big family, and uh, I think uh, we've got great leadership uh, at our police department and a lot of good people to learn from. Mm -hmm. So uh, I see Ruben's here today, and um, so you know, you've got a good support team. So yeah. Congratulations. Thank Wonderful. You. We're glad you're here. Thank you Thank for being you. here. So, um, Gosh, if I say chief, there's three people that could look up. So, I'll, uh, <laughs> so does this mean we're able to move our one dispatcher into the uh, animal control chief. position? So not yet. It depends on. Um, so right now they're in the training program. Okay. But as soon as they become participating members of our dispatch team, they okay. will be able to have that transfer. And so I hope it'll be soon. A couple months, or that's that's what we're hoping for. A lot of it depends on them and how they progress through the training program. Very so good. It's very okay. individualized. Thank you. Okay. Next up, presentation by Imperial County Film Commission. Hello, Missy. Hello. Did good you evening. give us? Uh, I did. You have a one sheet in front one of you. One sheet. There we go. Okay. It's a, a report on last fiscal year, so you can see how we did last year give you a little information about how we're doing so far this year. Okay. Um, just as a reminder, the mission of the Film Commission is to attract production and media companies to Imperial County, maximizing the county's economic potential by promoting locations, accommodations, services, and talent from the area. The ICFC also seeks to efficiently uh, mediate the permitting process between private owners, federal, state, local agencies, and the film industry. So that is our mission. Um, we see a wide array of media come down and film in the valley, everything from stills for catalogs and, pr and product to magazines, music videos, commercials, TV uh, series and reality, video games, web content, and all kinds of other means of <laughs> media. Uh, last fiscal year, we did track 69 uh, different projects that filmed in the Valley, and that uh, represents an estimated economic impact of $1,730,050. So far in fiscal year 17-18, we have had 40 completed projects. Actually, by the end of the week, it'll be 43 completed projects. 
Um, and the estimated economic impact on those projects is $1,027,000. So that's where we are so far this fiscal year. Um, some highlights from last year, if you've seen the Kesha music video for Praying, that was all filmed around the Salton Sea and at uh, Salvation Mountain, Slab City. Um, we've had B-roll for uh, oh, Doctor Strange, and we've had all kinds of different different projects. We've had a lot of commercials, uh, a lot of people filming out in the deserts and around the Salton Sea. Those are our two uh, major areas. And oh, Mayans, that was the other one I wanted to recommend or mention. Uh, Mayans was shot in Clexico. The, the crew did stay in El Centro. Uh, Mayans was picked up for series. Uh, just in January, so hopefully um, in the coming year we, we'll get a visit or two from them for the series, so I'm excited about that. And, you know, I'm just here to, they would appreciate the working relationship that we have with the City of El Centro and the Film Commission. We do great work to, to uh, impact the economy. People stay in the hotels, they eat in the restaurants, they rent, they buy gas, <laughs> whatever they're doing. And uh, your support helps us to continue the work of the Film Commission. And I hope that you'll consider for um, continuing your support of the Film Commission into the future. So I really don't have too much more to say. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, we had a film festival, just to remind you of that, in October. And um, we do have a uh, a feature film that we're looking at for next year already. And I just got news that a couple of our um, entries from this year's festival got accepted into some more um, even prestigious film festivals back east. So it's very exciting things happening there. It is there. very cool. Mm -hmm. um, Mr. Carter? You know, I, I uh, serve as an alternate uh -huh. to the uh, film commission, and it's really good. I, I appreciate the, uh, the oversight and the... Um, the economic development that they bring and some of the larger productions uh, when they when they come out here and they film it's about three weeks of prep two weeks of filming and then another two weeks of uh, cleanup and being that we have 73 percent of the hotel inventory it's obviously very very favorable to us so i'm um, again very supportive of your of the work that you do i also like getting the emails and the strange requests that you send out hey i'm I, looking I do for send a, out some strange yeah ones. 1980 uh, <laughs> torino uh, yeah <laughs> I do so get usually my cars are old, so usually I uh, um, <laughs> get to help out with some of those requests. So, yes. <laughs> no, I do appreciate you, Sharla, and, and uh, everything that you do, and I'm hopeful that our budget can still continue to uh, to help and, and support their efforts. Yeah, I, I think, you know, I've, I've been on the Film Commission for uh, several years, past many president. Years. Yeah, many years. Many years. <laughs> and, um, um, my, my company supports the yes, Film Commission. Do. I think that you guys do great work, and um, you know, a lot of this was lost prior to the Film Commission really kind of gathering these people and pushing them in the right direction and getting the permits and uh, getting the um, um, uh, go ahead from property owners. And I mean, even still, we still see people come down and try to shoot without getting the yes, permitting. That and, does happen. <laughs> and, um, but I think, you know, this is a, is a great organization. I think it's, you know, it's really highlighted some of the economic development. Um, potential for the Valley, and uh, Charlotte's done a great job with um, her work at the state level of really putting our area on the map, and, and um, so yes, I would, I would certainly um, uh, like to continue our support. I think it's, it's money well spent, so congratulations on another great year. Thank you. Charlotte, I've had the pleasure of being on the Film Commission this year, and by the way, you're a fabulous bartender. <laughs> <laughs> I have also had to, I've also had the pleasure of volunteering for some of the community events. So there's different aspects to what the Film Commission does. It's not just trying to bring about economic development, but it's also having these community events, premieres. You know, like Star Wars was great, and also the uh, the other ones you have throughout the year. We have some fun. But uh, you know, <laughs> it, it's it's great to see people from all over the county come come to those, and they really enjoy themselves, and also just the, the great work that you do in, in helping this organization <coughs> plug along. And, and it's we're seeing the the dividends when we see all these shows or movies being filmed out here. And, and it's great to see that, that we have this in the county. 
So I, I definitely support this commission and hope that we can uh, assist in any way we can. Mr. Silva. Thank you, uh, Madam Mayor. I think likewise, I, I fully endorse and support the work that you do in the organization, Charlie, and I think I always kind of enjoy hearing your reports and kind of get updated as to what's happening and, and you know, 69 projects, uh, that's amazing. I think very few people really see that other than perhaps the board members, but the, the right. community in general. Most people many. don't know how much is going yeah. on. And then for 43 sure. projects in two months and that's, I mean, that's, is that normal because no, of the time of the year? In a fiscal year since July. Oh, since, since July. July, okay, Sorry. all right. Um, <laughs> But that's still, I mean, that's, that's amazing. Uh, and, and I will continue to support the Tone Commission. But, uh, but a couple of things though, um, as I recall a few, maybe a year or so ago, there was a couple of films that I don't know if they ever made it to the big screen. One was um, about, uh, Jim Carrey. Yeah, did The Bad that, Batch. Yeah, did that make it to okay, the? Okay, so that was in limited release. It is available on Netflix at the moment. So you can. What's it called? Bad Batch. Okay. Make sure that you don't have Super high expectations. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> you got to be in one of those. Okay, I'm just going to experience this kind of moods. Um, and then the other is Future World um, with James with Franco. James Franco. Right. And it is in post, and we're actually talking to them about possibly showing it at the film festival this year. Um, they're looking at distribution at the moment, so we don't have any guarantees on that. And the other one was the other James Franco movie, which was uh, Come Back from the Moon. And that one is complete. Um, they are in talks with their distribution. Uh, it went to AFM this year, American Film Market, and found a, a home. So I don't have all the details on that, but again, it's another one of those that I talk to the, to the director of those two films semi-frequently. Um, Bruce, he loves the Imperial Valley. <laughs> And uh, so just trying to encourage him to show it, especially because we had so many local extras and people that were local that worked on those films, they want to see the work come to fruition on the screen. So uh, we're still trying to do that, but that one is complete. Yeah. And, and of course, you know, the, the area and our weather it brings it up, but I want to say that uh, the few times that I've been able to see you in action with some of the projects that, um, that we have seen, People, people absolutely love you, and, and I think you're the reason why they come here because of you. Think so. Exactly. Yeah. Thanks, exactly. I appreciate yeah. that. Thank you very much. We do appreciate your expertise. Um, the the Star Wars themed event out at the Dunes. Yes. Are we gonna have another one of those this coming year. Uh, we are, and that's a that's a UDG event. Uh -huh. My other organization. Your other hat. Yeah, my other hat. <laughs> um, we ended up having to cancel it this year. We had it on the books for uh, February 13th, I think it was. Um, or third, uh, but we had these pieces that normally come into place and everything works really well and all of a sudden they just fell completely oh, apart, okay. like our transportation and mm -hmm. things like that. But yes, we are planning on doing it again. Okay. If we can't get it done by uh, Easter, it will be next year, uh, probably in February again. Okay, and then we don't hear much about tax credits anymore like the states competing with one another for It has tax calmed credit. down because California does have um, a tax incentive. Maybe it's not as robust as places like New Mexico or mm -hmm. Louisiana, but we do have a tax incentive. We are seeing uh, quite a bit of TV coming back. Oh, good. Um, and we received one, um, one project last year uh, that got the 5% bump because they filmed mm -hmm. outside mm -hmm. of the uh, TMZ zone. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it's making a difference. We're seeing, like I said, TV coming back. There is uh, more uh, movies coming back. Marvel is bringing some of that back from Atlanta. Um, so it's a slow process, but we're still working on that. Uh, it is up for renewal next term, I do believe. Don't quote me on that. But uh, I do get those that information and uh, talk with the CFC to make sure if when the time is right for any letter writing or support for those things, mm -hmm. I'll let you know. Perfect. Well, you've taken a lot of the frustration out of the process, we know, with regard to you being able to work your magic and with the permitting and all of that. And we do really congratulate you on, on job you. well done and, and the economic impact that you have. Thank you. Thank you for being here. All right. Thanks, you guys Charles. have a good evening. Thanks. So,
you know, I'm in LA <coughs> at least once a month for um, SCAG related stuff and I stay at the Biltmore downtown. And I bet every single time I've been there the last two years, there's been filming going on there. Yeah, it was pretty fun. Um, okay, next on our agenda is a pr presentation by the Imperial Valley Small Business Development Center. And it's a new face. It's me. Good <laughs> evening. Good evening, Mayor and Council members. It's a pleasure for me to be here and have a presentation about the 2017 performance and 2018 goals for the Small Business Development Center. I have a couple slides in order to go over of what it's our mission, our vision, services, and also about uh, 2018 goals. I'm gonna go ahead and start. Basically about the Small Business Development Center, who we are and our mission for the uh, econo economic development, it's to provide business counseling for small business owners and for startups in order, in order to help out the economic impact here in our county in City of El Centro. Our vision is to become the number one resource for small business owners and for startups assistance. In our services, I will go in more in detail in the next slides. As far as I do want to mention about the future opportunities that we have for the Small Business Development Center. This is a great program that help out the community to have more resources available. And we want to become the center of excellence for entrepreneur and innovation in the future in order to promote more business environmental and being friendly here in our community. And this is who we are, at the ISPDC. If I move forward, uh, we are part of a regional network. We are part of San Diego and Imperial Valley. And we, are, we have five centers. We're very proud to mention that in the new center opened this January, the USD Technology Center, great partner for Imperial Valley SBDC. We're collaborating and working together as a big family. And now talking more about the SBDC, what we do. We are focused on our clients and we have two different clientele, which is the entrepreneur, the one that does have the big idea, but it's looking for guidance, it's looking for counseling in order to start their process. And also, we reach out the small business owner that it's looking for an expansion, that it's looking for doing innovation under business and have new product development, have access to loans, access to any other resources that can help our economy and their business. These are our clients. And now talking more about data. In 2017, our percentage of clients in, in Imperial County, 34% of our clients were located in El Centro. 27% in Calexico, 16% in Raleigh, 19% in Imperial. Our major count is in El Centro. And I'm gonna talk more about what kind of industry will help out. As for uh, our host center, it's Imperial Regional Alliance. And we had an initial contract from June to December 2016. By 2017, we became the host center. And we were able to help out 70 clients here at City of El Centro. I did a, a list of the type of businesses that we help out. I'm not allowed to make full disclosure of these businesses, but I can mention about that we, we help out in food and enter, entertainment services, agribusiness, transportation, and, and others. Also, I do want to mention about 2017 uh, results. For last year, we had seven startups in City of El Centro. And in capital infusion for our clients here in the city, we help out with 1,617,500,000. Here in the city, one year. What would, what would go hmm? into that transportation bucket? What types of? Uh, it's a different truck, uh, trans log truck and logistics. OK, mm -hmm. thank you. As far as services, like I mentioned before, we help out with startup assistance. We provide counseling hours, and I will mention more about what kind of topics we help out the clients. And also, part of our mission is to provide trainings in order to satisfy the needs of the community. 
As part of the business counseling, just to mention some topics, we help out with business plan development, marketing, financial assistance, government contracting, international trade, social media and online marketing. But this is only some of the topics we do help out according to the client needs and how they are looking for uh, expand their business or start up their business. We are opening our services. We're always looking for experts and we're partnering with different organizations in order to provide more to our clients. And regarding the client benefits, being part of the SBDC, you have counseling, you being helped out in order to thrive in business. But we're helping out on job creation. We're helping out and in increase their sales, access to capital. Like I mentioned before, CDFL Central, 1,600,000 for 2017, and we're looking forward to increase that for 2018. And now, uh, I do wanna talk about the results more, more in depth about 2017. The Small Business Development Center, it's partially funded by the Small Business Administration. We do have three key performance indicators that are on top. Long-term clients, which means every client that does have more than five business counselings, and business startups and capital infusion. Last year, our goal was to have 40 long-term clients. Our results were for 58. Business startups, we achieved 16, and our goal was for 12. And capital infusion, our goal was for 1,500,000. Our result was for 3 million. More than the goal was achieved for here for City of El Centro. Jobs created in the whole county, 191. Changing sales, 15,854,654. Training events, we had six. And counseling hours, we have 708 in the whole county. <coughs> Regarding economic impact, like I mentioned before, 199 jobs, changing sales, counseling hours, and trainings. Now, uh, I would like to talk more in depth about 2018 goals and how does SBA uh, had uh, applied the goals for each uh, center in the region. For Imperial Valley for 2018, we're looking for 50 long-term clients, business startups 15, and capital infusion 2,500,000. Our, our goal for capital infusion was raised for 1 million for this year but we're looking forward not only to achieve the two million, to increase that and help out more our clients and have more access to different resources for our small business owners. How are we gonna make that happen? We built a 2018 strategic plan. In order to uh, actually identify who our clientele, uh, we're looking for client diversification. The Small Business Development Center, it's to help out startups, but also to help out small business owners that it's looking for different kind of advice and that it's looking for growing their organization. That's why we have the business expansion and attraction. We have international trade exporting business assistance. We have the entrepreneur and innovation, but also internally we're looking for enhance our efficiency, also implementing trending uh, social media management, uh, have more partners. We do believe in the philosophy of working with different organizations in order to have more for our clients. And also promote learning, growth, a good foundation. It's always gonna be the base of our uh, counseling and that we provide to our clients. Professional development, enhanced technology, and also strategic partners. And part of the SBDC, it's doing workshops. So far, we have 18 workshops planned. The first workshop of the year was held here in El Centro Chamber of Commerce. It was about basic sales and use tax seminar. We had a representative from the state of California to provide uh, this training specifically. And tomorrow we're having another uh, workshop that will take place in, in Calexico about social media for businesses. But we're working on enhancing, right now it's our current calendar, but what we do is we plan ahead in order to satisfy the business needs from our clientele. As far as the 2018 update, update we have a month and a half so far, and we have helped 14 clients, and I'm very pleased to announce that two of them already are a startup business, 
And as far as capital infusion, 26,000. And this is just for one, one part of the month. But this is uh, what the small business developments had accomplished 2017. What are we looking for 2018? And all these efforts is translated in community benefits. We're looking for helping more our clients in order to thrive in business and make successful and wise decisions in order to help out the community. If we have more resources available, I know that we can make that happen and we can continue growing as part of our community. And today, I would like to respectfully request your support in funds in the amount of 10,000 in order to sustain the growth of the organization of the Small Business Development Center and help out more our community. For any questions or comments? You know, uh, one of the things that I wanted to share is um, what's sometimes helpful for me when I'm looking at requests is, mm -hmm. is uh, customer testimonies. So I know you mentioned that some, you know, at times you're not you're not uh, eligible to or not able to disclose who those businesses are. But maybe, you know, if there are businesses that wanted to give a testimony to what you guys have done to increase their sales, I, you know, that's important. So um, maybe in the future they could consider sharing those successes, and that's sure. what really carries a lot of weight and maybe making some of these decisions. And then, and then in regards to just uh, some of your funding partners. Um, any other cities or counties that are supporting your efforts currently now or are scheduled to support you in 2018-19? Yes, right now uh, we had approached uh, the, all the cities we are in discussions and agreed. And right now uh, also we applied with the county and we have their support. Okay. Any finance, have they said that they're going to support you financially? Yes. Okay, not, but they haven't established a dollar amount as no. of yet? No. Okay. Madam Mayor, um, in consulting with with our city attorney, um, as you might have seen, one of the uh, services on there that's a um, uh, current client is security <laughs> services, and I'm actually engaged with the um, SPDC on some capital infusion to my company, so I think that I should probably recuse myself um, on the recommendation of our city attorney, but um, as far as testimony, they, they do great work, but I just <laughs> yeah, no, I can't really say Thank anymore. Thank you. <laughs> I'm just curious as to what we uh, have historically done in terms of supporting the SBDC. Mm -hmm. I know that we, we did support them last year, um, but I'm curious as to what that amount was um, and also what the commitments are from the other cities and the county as well. So I think um, we certainly, during our budget discussions, will be considering the allocation for the coming year, and I know that, um, Marcella, you can make sure that we have the historic data available and sure. then you can provide us with the information on um, other pledges from sure, the I'll be other happy. Mm -hmm. governmental agencies. Uh, as I recall, our, Marcella, our, is, wasn't our contribution last year 5000 uh, No, it uh, was reduced to $1,000. $1,000, okay. Well, I think we will probably hopefully be able to do better uh, this year. Thank you, Meredith, for a really good presentation, a very thorough. Uh, it's always kind of good to remind ourselves what the SBDC does uh, and the benefits that it provides to our community. And, um, you know, you've been on the job for how long? Just, you just knew, right? How, how well, I've been in the, I've been providing counseling a year and a half, but as director, one month, it's starting January 1st. <laughs> yeah. So I know that you're going to do a, a terrific job. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Good data. Thank and, you. And as, as it was mentioned, um, when we began to talk about our, our budget for 16, 7, I'm sorry, for 18, 18 19. 19. Wow. Uh, well, um, you know, we'll, we'll make sure that we incorporate that, uh, some funding allocation for the SBDC because I do think it's important. Thank you so much. Thank you for your support and had a great evening. So we're meeting tomorrow at 9 o'clock? We are. So, okay. <laughs> and then uh, just a quick question. Have yes. the, the um, state and federal budgets and what they're doing and what their approach is to small business development. Have you had a chance or someone had a chance to kind of interpret what that's going to look like for the coming year or? I'm having a meeting tomorrow with the lead center and they will provide more information about what's the final resolution and how is that positive impact for the SPDC centers. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. Okay. Um, Mr. Jackson, you can come back now. <coughs>
Consent agenda, we have items for consideration five through 12. Is there anyone that would like to pull anything from the consent calendar? I'm good. Okay, so we will take as one motion then items uh, five through 12. Consent calendar is adopted 5-0. We now move on to item number 13, the CalPERS actuarial issues valuation. Ms. Salcido. Uh, good evening, Mayor and Council Members. Welcome to the CalPERS actuarial issues valuation. As you know, one of the major concerns for the city during the budget process is the increasing majorly increasing uh, costs at CalPERS, which is a retirement cost for our employees. Um, for example, as of 2007, the cost was approximately $2.5 million. Uh, as of 2018, the budget included uh, $5.7 million for the CalPERS cost, of which $5.2 million was in the general fund. Uh, some, one of my duties as a finance director, and especially during the budget process, is to track any changes at CalPERS, such as actuarial changes, uh, discount rate changes, and CalPERS investment losses. Um, one of my other duties also is on a periodic ba basis, uh, have an independent review of our CalPERS. And we have uh, with us today Doug Pryor of Bartell and Associates, who will be going over uh, the results of that review. Um, then we have also a PowerPoint presentation for that endeavor. And okay. Thank you. Um, good evening. Um, what, what I have, the PowerPoint is really uh, just s s the slides that are in your packet of the um, um, of our report, the analysis that we put together. Um, it's a little lengthy, probably not very easy to read, to be honest. But um, what I'm going to do is try to <coughs> kind of run through some key points here. Um, but it is all by all means, as I go along, if you have questions or if something came up in your review that you um, would like to ask, please um, stop me you know, at any point as we go along. We have um, a few slides on kind of background of how we got to where we are today, um, a few slides on um, uh, recent CalPERS changes, and then we kind of get into the miscellaneous plan program and the safety plan program. I should also mention that, um, you know, it, <laughs> it's, it, it's amazing to me um, you know, when you look back, how often there are significant changes in the CalPERS program, right? This document here is dated November 29th, right, of last year. In December, uh, CalPERS went ahead and approved revised assumption changes. Those changes are not probably have a very significant impact on, on rates across the state. And then um, just last week, they adopted revised amortization policy methods, which um, will have a little bit of impact on, on your, your contributions um, and, and all agencies across the state. So at any rate, we're, this document is only a few months old and already there's changes that are not, not included here. Um, so flip forward to kind of background on you know, how we got here. Big, the big driver, of course, is the uh, investment returns. Um, this has the historical returns going back over a little over a 20-year period. Um, as you can see, the and probably recall the painful 2001-2002 drop there, negative 7.2 followed by negative 6.1% return. Um, and then you also had the financial crisis in 09, the negative 24% return. Those events were, um, you know, very obviously very difficult to recover from. What this chart shows, you can see the, the volatility of the returns. You can see all the up and downs. What this doesn't show is that if you look back over a 30-year period, the return has been about 8.2%, OK? 
okay? If you look back over 20 years, not quite as good, 6.6% return. Um, so, you know, long term, they really have done pretty well. Um, you know, over the last five to 10 years, not, not quite as well. And what's probably more important is not so much what's happened historically, but obviously what's gonna happen going forward. And a lot of investment advisors we're hearing, in fact, CalPERS investment advisors um, have told them that, that they expect subpar returns for 10 years. And that's a, that's a big issue as you look to where your rates are going forward. Did you say that the 6% return for the last 20 years? 6.6 uh, .6 for the last 20 years. And yet CalPERS has hung on to that 7.5% return for that entire time. Yeah, well, yeah, they're they're finally dropping it, right? It's coming down to 7 as of the June 30, 18 valuation. Which is but, still yeah. above what the historic average for the last 20 years has been. Right, right. So... Now, it, and, and these returns also include kind of higher inflation going back historically, right? So there's there's kind of multiple layers here, but you know, um, in terms of long-term returns, they've been um, fairly good. Um, we just have a brief slide just to kind of more to set the table a little bit with benefits here. We have the uh, miscellaneous program, uh, two and a half, at, I'm sorry, two at 55 and then PEPRA for uh, new members hired on or after January 1 to 13. Safety members have the three at 50 formula with 2.7 at 57. So um, the three at 50, when that was adopted, it applied to all past service. Um, so that has a, you know, that's, that was not an agency um, uh, option at that point. If you adopt the three at 50 formula, CalPERS required you apply it not just to future, but past service too. That, Created, you know, additional liabilities across the state for agencies who went to the higher formulas. Um, and finally, um, you know, this is, um, if you go back to 2003, uh, CalPERS, I think, was kind of getting some criticism for how much the rates were jumping around. It was difficult for agencies to manage um, and budget for. And so they came up with this um, policy to smooth out the investment fluctuations, right? And the fact of the matter is, is it, it would have worked great if they had met their assumptions going forward. But when they didn't, there was so much smoothing in that agencies got further and further behind. And so you'll see on the miscellaneous plan, a significant ramp up in the contributions over the last five or so years. And you might look at that and think, well, you know, it's, it, we've already paid a lot more in, this should be the end of it. And in fact, it's gonna continue to go up. That's because um, because of those rate smoothing policies they had back years ago that have been, have been kind of built into the contributions for quite a while, agencies across the state have kind of underpaid and not, it's the same as a credit card debt in a way. If you have a balance and you don't at least pay interest, you get a little further behind. The same thing happens with the unfunded liability in a pension plan. You have an unfunded liability to the extent you don't pay the interest on the unfunded liability, you get a little further behind. Um, and, and then we have final note here, just this is, um, you know, across the state certainly too, and, and we kind of have the numbers here for, for the city. Um, a larger and larger portion of the liability is for uh, former employees across the state, former employees here. Um, in, in fact, in, in this uh, statistic we're looking at, a uh, portion of the liability belonging to retirees is 47% of the liability for miscellaneous plan and 66% for safety. So the more of the former employees you have collecting benefits, um, you know, the, the higher the costs are gonna look in comparison to your payroll, and the more you're gonna be pay, playing kind of catch up on benefits that have already been earned and, uh, by, by uh, people that have worked for the city in the past. Uh, we have a history here of a, a number of the changes that have gone, that have occurred through Cal, through the last five plus years. Um, maybe unless you have questions on these, I, maybe I won't go through all the detail. Probably um, the most the most important thing is just the concept that w the Calpers, you know, in transitioning from that policy where they were kind of overly smoothing out contributions, they put in this policy to kind of no longer smooth out the contributions, but to ramp up. So the concept was you have a liability created at some point in time, 
Um, rather than never paying it off, you're gonna pay it off, but you're gonna do it on a schedule that ramps you up over a five-year period to get to a, a payment uh, to pay down that unfunded liability. Um, and, and finally, this, this chart um, is um, probably, let me kind of explain what this is. One of the changes CalPERS has made is that they are uh, put in what they call the risk mitigation strategy, right? And the idea here is that, uh, you know, it, it, look a few slides back, you have a over, you have 66% of your liability is for former, is for retirees, people that retired directly from the city. Well, you can look at this similar like a 401k plan, right? If you're a 60 year old, you might invest the funds one way. If you're 20 year old, you might be a lot more aggressive, right? Mm -hmm. CalPERS is no longer the 20 year old. They're the, the 60 year old or, or older. And so, um, they, I think they believe, and I think most people would agree, they, they should be more conservative with the investments. Um, the problem is, if they just change that investment policy tomorrow, they'd have to change the discount rate immediately, right? And rates would go further up and be more bad news. So they came up with this, this strategy to wait for years where there are um, very good returns, and in those years, they're going to um, reduce the kind of the equity exposure, reduce the risk in the portfolio, and drop the discount rate. It's not on a set schedule, so it could depend on where the returns are in the future. Um, and so what this chart is showing is that the thick green line is where we expect the discount rate to be in each of the future valuations. So they're on a set schedule to get to 7% by the June 30, 18 valuation. And then after that, it's going to depend on what the, what the returns are in the future. The thick green line is where we expect you to be. The line shooting up or down or based on our modeling, um, kind of catching the where half the time their discount rates are expected to be in 90% of the time. So it's meant to give you kind of an idea for likely ranges. But I think effectively you should look at this and think, although it's not exactly going to work like this, you're probably going to be on that path at the thick green line where Every few years, CalPERS is going to drop their discount rate a little bit, increase the liability. There's going to be another lever to kind of push or another um, reason for why your contributions are going to increase. So that's kind of general background. Um, if we move forward to the miscellaneous plan, you know, real quickly on this slide, the only thing I'll point out is the June 30, 16 column there, you'll, you'll see um, 177 actives. Um, and 155 former employees that retired um, from the city. So almost one-to-one, -one, but not quite for the miscellaneous program. I'll try to jump forward a few more. If you go to this slide, this is showing, um, uh, you know, the June 30, 16 column there is the, from the most recent CalPERS actuarial valuation report. That shows an accrued liability there of $71.8 million, assets of $55.8 million, and the unfunded liability of $16 million. This is based on a 7% um, dis, I'm sorry, 7 7.375% discount rate. Um, and you know, I think a better measure would be at seven, but nonetheless, this is from the report showing $16 million unfunded liability for the uh, miscellaneous program. Um, in terms of what happened between 15 and 16, there's a lot of detail here, but if you look at, um, you know, the, the unfunded liability increased by five and a half million dollars, that top row, $4 million was for an asset loss because the return for um, June 30, 16 was well below expected. They then changed the discount rate down to 7.375. So most of the change is investment return assumptions. That's kind of a, right, a repeating theme throughout this. We have a, a few historical graphs. Maybe I'll cut, touch on a couple of these real quick. Um, funded ratio here for the miscellaneous plan. This is looking at the ratio of um, uh, assets to actual accrued liability. Um, you know, what you see here is, you know, well overfunded or perhaps even superfunded back in early 2000, um, well above 140% funded, and then you have the kind of market downturns in 2000, 2001, and things kind of come down, a little bit of improvement, um, and then in the um, 09 uh, return, things kind of drop. 
um, at that point in time. And what you also see here is if you look from 2009, um, you know, 2009, 2010, it's in the mid high 70% 70, 70 funded ratio. Take 2000, um, my eyes can read this, 2010, 77%. We're projecting June 3018 to be 76%. So you see a long period, not much improvement, right? Now just for comparison uh, purposes, and I know our mayor just gave her state of the city, but we're still, in, in regards to miscellaneous, where are we ranking as far as other municipalities in the state? Yeah, you're probably a little better. I mean, because you don't have the 2.7 at 55, you don't have the um, enhanced formulas that a lot of other agencies have. So from that um, perspective, in terms of contributions, you're in, in better shape. I think the funded status might be a little better too for that same reason for the miscellaneous plan. Not not true for the safety. Safety, I think you're more typical. So. T um does the state average typically for municipalities or where, where do you typically see these uh, municipalities? I know you're, I said we're, we're above average maybe, but where do you typically see? Uh, on the funded it, status? On miscellaneous, yes. Um, well, if you're, I mean, there's not a huge difference. I think if you're, um, you know, not many are above 70, you know, so 70, 76, 70, 70 to 80 percent, almost all miscellaneous plans are in that range. I think maybe, um, uh, you know, might be certainly um, a number that are below in the lower 70s instead of 76 percent. Mm -hmm. So you might be a little better off there. But, you know, miscellaneous a little better off. I mean, a lot of almost almost all the comments I've made would apply across the state, right? You're, and you'll see that in your contribution projections. Unfortunately, and maybe fortunately, unfortunately, however you want to look at it, right? You, you, your your Calpers issues are the same as every other almost every other agency we're looking talking to in the state right now. But in terms of the funding liability part, our, my assumption has always been that we've done a very good job in ensuring that this liability is funded. I mean, I mean, yeah. if you were to Google right now and say, okay, CalPERS crisis, mm -hmm. you would see that a lot of cities are, are being challenged in this area. But what I'm hearing from you is that that's not entirely the case, at least in regards yeah. to miscellaneous. With miscellaneous, and when you look at the contribution rates, which are probably are, are a, you know, a better indication of the pain coming down the road, right? They're going to be lower than most agencies. You have a lower formula, benefit formula. So in terms of how much you have to contribute going forward, it, you're in a little you're in a little better shape. Okay. Um, I jump forward a couple. You know, historically, I made the I made this comment um, before about the rates having increased over the last five to ten years. This this shows it graphically. We we have two lines here. The um, uh, the lighter green triangular marker line is the normal cost rate. Um, but the darker green um, with the square markers is the total contribution rate. What you see there is, right, it was super uh, funded back in the early 2000s. There was no contributions required. And then what you see is it ramping up and over from 2000 and, um, you know, 05, 06, it was about a 7.1% contribution rate. That's more than doubled uh, uh, for next year will be about 16.3% of payroll. And you'll see later when we project this out, there are increases uh, that will uh, escalate well beyond this. Um, I'll, let me I'll jump forward to the projections. Um, I, I, I'll make a couple comments before maybe I, I talk about these projections. I mean, we've taken into account, um, you know, it, Pretty much everything we know at this point, not the most recent changes in the last few months, um, but we're taking into account a subpar investment return over the next 10 years, taking into account that you're going to be hiring um, new employees under the PEPRA formula. We might be a little conservative in that um, project, in that assumption, and that we may be assuming, you know, more people are in the, under the higher uh, classic formula than are really going to occur. So it might be a little conservative in that re regard. But um, you know we've kind of built in everything we know about the, the program at this point. And what this is showing is 
Um, your current contribution as a percent of payroll for miscellaneous is 17.8% of payroll, I'm sorry, 14.5% of payroll. Um, and if you follow the thick green line up, that shows by 28-29, we're projecting it to be 28.6% of payroll. Um, and what you have, uh, the lines shooting up and down there um, are kind of based on investment returns. You could think of that as kind of a good scenario and a bad scenario. It technically is the based on um, the ranges of investment returns in the future. It's kind of the 50% the of the time you'll be somewhere in between those two points, the upper and the lower, okay? So half the time in 28, 29, we expect to be somewhere between 22% of payroll and 36% of payroll. Um, the, recent, the recent changes last week are gonna exacerbate this graph. It's gonna do two things, really. The 28.6% of payroll is gonna be a little bit higher. Um, and the 22 to 35 is gonna spread out even further. Um, we haven't had time to look at it closely, but I think it may be, you know, two to 5% on the bottom and two to 5% on the top. So there's gonna be more volatility in the future based on that, that amortization policy change that CalPERS made last week. Um, so, you know, again, you know, this is kind of given a good and bad scenario. You could look at it that way. So if you're thinking of it that way, you're at 14.5% of payroll this year. That's projecting even kind of under a good scenario, 22.1% of payroll. So unfortunately, you know, a takeaway from this is that we're saying we think it's unlikely that returns are going to be good enough that you're going to have you're not gonna end up having to contribute substantially more in the future to the program, right? Because even under a good scenario here, you're still gonna uh, end up at over 22% of payroll for quite a while. It's gonna Long, double. Oh, sorry. It's, it's gonna double in 10 years. Right. And these are percent of payroll. We have another showing dollar amounts, which is gonna show the, the doubling. Um, and f you know, this is through 28, 29. If you look at this longer term, Unfortunately, I don't know that any of us will be here for the <laughs> out there. And who knows how many millions of changes there'll be in the in the program between now and then. But long term, the rates are expected to come down. The program the contributions at this point are paying the unfunded liability down, or will in the in the near future. And at that point, at some point, that liability will be paid down, and the um, the contributions are expected to drop. But it's a long ways out. So this is, and we'll, the safety program is going to be very similar, so it will, we'll, it's, it may seem like we um, haven't covered much and we're a long ways in, but safety will go um, fairly quickly. And I could just point out on, the, on this slide, this is showing the kind of the two components of the contribution, um, normal cost amortization payment, um, but you have the green line is a percent of payroll where we project, where we expect the contribution rates to go. CalPERS is assuming payroll will grow by 3% annually in the future. So if you look at these in terms of dollar amounts, which is here, you can see a steeper, a steep, much steeper slope here. So you have about a $1.3 million um, expected contribution this year that's projected to be almost 3.9 by uh, 2029, okay? Um, so that's, that's the miscellaneous plan. If I could jump forward to safety, and I won't again cover all of these, but what you'll see here, are 84 public safety officers in 2016. In this case, you have well over that 149 former safety officers that are retired and actually collecting benefits. The unfunded liability, again, this is at 7.375%, uh, so I think is a little optimistic. Unfunded liability here is about $30.1 million as of June 30, 16. Now, the safety program is in the risk pool. Miscellaneous, you have a standalone plan. Safety is in the risk pool, so we have different charts because different information is available in the CalPERS reports when we look at historical um, data. So I'm gonna, there's just, you know, in a nutshell, there's not as, as much information on the risk pool um, historically, so I'll just jump forward to the contribution projections here on safety. Um, 
So So here, um, we're kind of jumping forward to the, here's where we expect your contributions to go as a percent of payroll, uh, with the total being the green line, the components are the orange normal cost rate, and the red, the um, uh, payment on the unfunded liability. So you see the big drop in 1819. When, um, when CalPERS prepares their valuations, and then in each valuation, to the extent the li unfunded liability either increases or decreases less than they expected, they set up a base and say, here's this, say, a million dollar increase in the unfunded liability, let's pay that million dollars off over a number of years. So what you have here is, actually when the city went into the risk pool many years ago, they set up a base, and that base is being paid off in 1718. So that's why you see the big drop there um, from 68% of payroll almost in this year to 42.9% of payroll next year. Um, you know, longer term, similar story to miscellaneous, uh, you know, significant increases, um, you know, the ex expectation is that the rates will come down over time. Um, but as you can see there on this chart, um, even kind of in a good scenario, you're going to be significantly above, um, you know, where you're going to be next year. That you, you're probably, you know, not going to be back where you were, um, where you are this year in terms of the 68% of payroll contribution. That likely won't happen for, for uh, may not happen again, but um, you will end up being well above where you're going to be next year for, for quite a while. Um, we have now here are the similar charts on um, percent of payroll uh, where we have the components. Uh, this is a roughly a 10 year projection. Um, and you can see here they are as a percent of payroll. Um, and then if you go down and look at this as, a, as dollar amounts, um, you know, you'll see because of the 3% escalator they built in that it, it ramps up even quicker. Um, so that's. Uh, kind of a quick quick run through of the information. Um, I think the, um, you know, again, certainly agencies are gonna vary depending on their formulas, depending on, you know, w what contribution schedule they've been on in the past, but, um, you know, th the challenges are, are very similar, right? The rates, contributions are expected to go up quite a bit over the next 10 plus years. Um, and so, and unfortunately, you know, there aren't a lot of great answers here, right? It's, it certainly looks to be that you're gonna have to put in more money and it's a matter of when that happens. So one of the things that's been quite popular is setting up a 115 trust. Um, so 115 trust is, um, well, let me, let me back up a sec just to explain one of the things about 115 trust. If you look at, say look at this chart here and look at that green line there where we expect your contributions to be, if you decided, well, let's do something about this, let's give more money to CalPERS, right? What CalPERS is gonna do is um, shift you down, but because of the way they amortize their bases, unless you do a lot of active management with CalPERS, and it, it may not even be possible, but um, if you just give them the money, which happens, they're gonna shift you down and you're gonna end up going back up again, okay? So if you gave them enough money to ramp that $2.9 million down by say $200,000, you'd be $200,000 lower there, but then you'll be say at almost you know 5.8 million at the end there, right? So you're kind of back on the same schedule. So one of the ways to avoid that and to kind of level out contributions is this 115 trust. The money that goes into the trust can only be used for contributions to CalPERS or to reimburse the city for contributions to CalPERS. So it's, it's consider irrevocable trust and that it can only be used for, for pension costs. Um, and the city um, has started one up and I understand put a million and a half in. And let me, um, I can jump forward to kind of illustrate, you know, one of the ways this might be used. Um, and in this example was, um, you know, I mentioned CalPERS has made a couple of changes since we put this document together. The city also put the money into the 115 trust after we put this document together. So this is just kind of though illustrating how it might be used. Um, and the concept here is that 
The green line is where we expect your contribution rates to go to the miscellaneous program. And with a trust set up where you decide you're gonna put the money in and then only take money out if your contributions are above where you want, expect to be, then you can kind of shift from being on that green line to the orange. So without getting into too many details, that's kind of the concept and one of the advantages to 115 trust is that you can, if you can afford to put the money in, you can level out your, your payments and you can kind of control your costs much better, not have the kind of volatility that you're gonna see in both programs. So um, a lot of agencies have, have looked at this. I think over 100 have set them up across the state. And as I said, as, as you're probably aware, you've set one up with uh, about a, a million and a half, I think it is, um, initial money to the trust. Is that what it is? I thought it was 500, but it's. But the general fund and then 500 plus water and 500 plus three. Okay, so it's 500 times three. Okay, that's, okay. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of what I had to um, cover. I don't know if there, if there are any questions or now that you've depressed the heck <laughs> out of <laughs> all of us um <laughs> any, any good news on that? <laughs> um i'll tell you what the good, i'll tell you what the good news is is that <laughs> that we are finally seeing this cities counties the states finally seeing this for the problem that it is i think for a really 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 long time we were just not paying attention right and yeah. i the change last week by calpers there are a lot of <laughs> there are a lot of changes they've made where I've thought that not that's a good idea that's a good you know unfortunately it may be painful but they should be doing that the change last week had me scratch my head to tell you yeah. the truth right I mean because th these numbers here are as I said all before that change and yeah. that change is only going to exacerbate it so I think it may go along with kind of what you're saying is that it's um, you know it, it's 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 going to happen here um, in terms of the, the increases. So the new change that happened this last month, did that have something to do with the new board members that were seated? Uh, well, they, they had a preliminary reading back in, was it November, on that issue. So um, I'm trying to remember the timing of the new board, but I don't think it did. So do we see any changes with the new board members coming on? Um, not it's like moving the Queen Mary. Yeah, I don't. Um. And what, what are you seeing anything in your work with other municipalities? Are you seeing any of the other other cities or, or uh, entities moving away from CalPERS or trying to look for alternatives? No, it, but the, the reason is, um, I, I shouldn't, let me tell you why, right? Is because right now um, CalPERS um, it, there's some there's some disagreement about whether or not they have to do this, but right now Calper's position is that if you leave the system, That's you have fine. to walk away from the liability and give them everything they're going to need to take care of the benefits going forward. So Calper's turns around and says, we can't invest the money to get seven percent even long term. We have to invest in high quality bond rates, high quality bonds, which are earning two three percent. And so your unfunded liability goes from 30 million to, it's in the report, I can look at it, but it's gonna be multiples of that. And so the problem is, is that they, they've kind of got agencies in a position where you don't really have can't options. Unless up. you have a lot of money, a lot of money, right? You can't quite get away. Another thing is you can't, um, you can't also um, say, okay, we're gonna stay, but new hires are gonna get a defined contribution plan, right? That would be another potential option here, but you can't do that with CalPERS either. Um, so, um, and I'm just full of like bad news, one, one, <laughs> uh, why, um, one thing after another, but that, that's Can you explain that, why, why you can't do that with new hires? All your employees have yeah. to be new. Right. Oh, they have to be. Yeah. Required in the contract. Yeah, I mean, we all, we have to, all belong to CalPERS or none, hours. but what it was your question, can we have two different retirement yeah, plans? Yeah, why, why can't we move forward with a, with a different plan for new hires? We can, but it still has to be, we can negotiate well, something different. Is it, that what you're asking? Yeah, that's what I was wondering. Yeah. Well, it could be, it could be a, a pension plan within CalPERS, 
right? right? But it can't be a, a 401k plan instead of a pension plan. Or, a, yeah, a defined contribution for a 3B or something like that. An employee who works over 1,000 hours in six of the year has to be a member of CAPEX. Right. right, but I think Jason's question is, if we've negotiated 3% at 50, oh. could new hires be brought on at 2% at 50? You can negotiate mm. a two-tiered, what the question is, can well, you negotiate a two-tiered MOU? Well, you have your second tier for the PEPRA people, right? Yeah. So um, that's already in there. If you're asking, can you do that for um, uh, classic employee, classic new hires? No. Yeah. Is that the question mm -hmm. then? Um, do that. Um, I'm not sure. I, I, um, I don't think we're contemplating think it. That. So yeah. I think we're. Okay. I just. Yeah. Did you well, maybe question? maybe if I may, Madam Mayor, at what point do we contemplate that though? I mean, if we're well, getting it, it, let me let me share just a, a couple of things. And um, so I'm on the League of California Cities okay. board, and Bartell and Associates was instrumental in um, coming up with this League of California Cities Retirement System Sustainability Study and Finding. Mm -hmm. It's now available on the um, League's website, and I just printed out one page for you, but it's it's a good read. Um, I'll share with you the first three findings of the study. So that rising pension costs, this is number one, rising pension costs will require cities over the next seven years to nearly double the percentage of their general fund dollars that they pay to CalPERS. Number two, many cities, for many cities, pension costs will dramatically increase to unsustainable levels. And number three, the impacts of increasing pension costs as a percentage of general fund spending will affect city, cities even more than the state. Employee costs, including police, fire, and other municipal services are a larger proportional share of spending for cities. So I think what they're, the other thing that they're anticipating is that there's gonna be fewer new hires because that pension cost simply becomes unsustainable. So people are gonna have to continue to try to get by with fewer employees but then that upsets the apple cart in terms of who's paying into the system as well. Right. Yeah. Well, that's joyful, thanks. Yeah, it was a mess. <laughs> they, uh, yeah. But no, the, the report's kind of interesting. It's not that long. Um. I know. You so think that we would too. There are cities that do allow them. Most of them are. Yeah. Because I didn't, yeah. I was asked so that question the other day and I forgot. I don't know. I know. I don't know. If I, yeah, could briefly with respect to the two tiers, we do have this slide here 41 for um, miscellaneous and 42 is on safety. Mm -hmm. um, right. But what this is showing is for your tier one employees, um, the, um, uh, I always have to think about how we're showing this here, but the um, employer normal cost is 8.8% of .8 payroll. The members are paying seven, so the total is 15.8, right? For your PEPRA employees, 6.51 is what the, the what the city's play, paying, six and a quarter is the member, so 12.76 in total. Um, because PEPRA is requiring that the members with, with rounding um, pay half of the normal cost, right? So PEPRA there, they're paying essentially half of the normal cost. And your your tier one classic employees are not that far from half either, right? They're close to paying half of the normal cost because the the um, employee rate that's set by statute is is 7% of payroll, right? And half would be 7.9. Now the safety is, is um, quite different, right? Because for safety, you have the three at 50 formula um, and here what you have is the city's paying 22% of payroll um, and the members are paying nine. Um, so Pepper would say that it had wording in there about targeting employees to pay half of the normal cost, but it didn't mandate it for tier one people, right? So uh, on your uh, three at 50 uh, tier one or classic members, the half of the normal cost would be 15.7% of payroll but they're paying by statute 9%, right? Now when you get to the PEPRA, now that's actually a smaller benefit, right? 
um, significantly smaller benefit, but what we see there is that the um, members are paying significantly more. They're paying 12.75% um, as a member rate for a lower benefit, right? The city's picking up 13%. Um, at the 50% target there is being met because that's what the law says is PEPRA members will pay half of the normal cost rate. Okay, so the tier one are certainly a lot more expensive in terms of the, um, uh, you know, employer contribution. It's 22% of payroll for tier one um, on safety versus only 13% on PEPRA, right? Um, our projections have built that in, right, that you're going to have more and more people coming in costing the city 13% of payroll rather than 22. But this kind of gives you an idea for the cost differential between um, those, for, those formulas um, going forward. Yeah, the max that you can maximum that you can impose um, is um, I always have to look back 12 12 percent for safety. So subject to um, you know you can't. I think that starts this year, 2018. Um, you can Im you can impose um, up to 12 percent as a contribution for safety employees. Well, that the 12, it, you could, for tier one, impose, rather than have employees pay 9%, you could um, r require they pay 12. You have to go through, I, my understanding is, um, you, have to, you have to go through a bargaining process, a yes. good faith right bargaining process, you can't just turn around and just Correct. impose it, but once you go through those steps, um, you could then, um, you know, increase the 9% to 12%. But so statutorily they could, they can, or we, they could inc increase the employee contribution part you, to 12. You, to 12, right. Part, Once you've gone through part of the bargaining, yeah. yeah, right. And, and you know, that's the concept of member rates. You could also negotiate to have employees pay more, right, on top of that. That's just for the employee rate, but you could, some agencies have done this, right, is um, negotiate to have employees pick up an additional piece of the employer rate on top of, of, of the 9% here. So you could have employees essentially pay more of the pension costs, um, of course, subject to, to bargaining. You know, just by comparison, I know that the, the state, you know, has over 60,000 correction officers you know, that, that would fall under, you know, public safety. I mean, what what type of, and I'm not sure if you can answer this, but what type of challenges are they seeing with the potential of 60,000 correction officers and, you know, having this potential um, funding liability that's not sustainable or it's, it's not sustainable? Yeah, I should have answered that, but I don't. I, I do not look much at the state um, uh, CalPERS program, so I, I don't know. Try to have an update for you at the next council meeting after the league meeting this coming weekend. I know, uh, Madam Mayor, that that uh, Ms. Alcido has some options before. So are we, uh, is, is, I'm assuming it's not information only. Are we are we looking at giving direction tonight or? I thought this was information. I thought their proposals are probably going to be coming forward as part of our, yeah, yeah part of our budget, right? Yeah, this yeah. is kind of like a preview of a train wreck. <laughs> <laughs> but we appreciate you, Mr. Pryor. We appreciate you being here. Right, eyes wide open. So, <laughs> there are any additional questions? Okay, where's your office space? We're in um, San Mateo. Okay. All right. Well, safe travels. Thank you. All right. Yeah. Thank you, Miss Alcido. Okay. So I think we are. Uh, the Community Enhancement Task Force minutes were included because they weren't included in your packet, so read those in your convenience. Let's go into council member reports. Who wants to start? No, I'll just go real quick. And, okay. and I know, I, I, you know what, I actually had a great, fun week with you guys. I think I'm spending too much time with you guys. Wasn't it like every night <laughs> we were together there for a week? It but uh, just real quickly, crazy. it's going to be a lot of uh, the common stuff. But uh, State of the City, awesome job, Mayor. Thank great you. turnout, great venue. 
Um, I like the twist on having it at night. Um, you know, congratulations to all our community champions and uh, uh, just great stuff. Mardi Gras, man, what, a, what a, that ship that they built and just uh, being on there and having fun and uh, just an incredible time. Um, you know, East, uh, the uh, uh, ECA, EC, RMC, yeah, Foundation Dinner again. Just hanging out with you guys is, uh, you know what, I really like you guys. It's like we were, we were together. And I like your spouses nights. too. Your spouses are pretty cool. Three nights in a row. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I really enjoyed herself. I'm glad staff, Marcella was there. And, and uh, you know what? I, I really get to like you guys. There so. we go. You've been drinking? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Usually when you come out with a testimonial, you've been drinking. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah same, same here. I mean, we, we did do, uh, it was nice that we were all able to be participating in, in all the events. Uh, together a lot of times there's only two or three of us but um I, every time we turned around we were all five together so that was kind of nice um same stuff air show gala was nice um with the chamber uh, state of the city good job uh to our mayor and we had our our mardi gras and the foundation dinner and um so yeah it's a good week so we also had the imperial valley auto ribbon cutting oh, which yeah. was yeah. pretty cool i think that they're going to be fantastic community partners yeah um, so that was on the 7th. On the 8th, I went up to um, San Diego SANDAG, Association of Governments, for their strategic planning session. And that was pretty, pretty interesting to see how they're dealing with some of the challenges in San Diego. So I told them that one of the reasons I went is because I wanted to make sure that SCAG didn't kick us out and make us um, become <laughs> part of SANDAG. League of California Cities Dinner. I thought that we always do a great mm -hmm. job hosting and having the folks from the NAFL Central was really good. Appreciated participating in the chief interviews, the HR department. You guys did an yeah. outstanding job bringing together the different panels and having the questions ready. And I thought the recruiter did an outstanding job. Um, yeah, Air Show Gala, State of the City, Mardi Gras, and uh, then the parade. And we were presented with this. Um, plaque as a hospitality award for the Chamber of Commerce. Nice. So I'll pass that over to Marcella. Well, I think we covered everything. Okay. <laughs> all righty. I, I was there too. No. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Okay. We were all there. Adam Mayor. Yes. Did you want the general legislation update? It's sort of a, it's not real cherry after the whole purse presentation. I'd be happy to do it another time or si just okay. simply send it to you. That, why don't you send that to us? Is okay. that okay? It will be on your email. Okay. The main thing you probably don't know about is housing. This is the year of the housing bill, as you well know. Yeah, right, right, right. And you will be seeing the changes in housing begin to come to you and changed ordinances probably starting next month. Yeah, I think Norma's going to have her uh, work she cut out for her. More exciting stuff? This well, is it's slightly the, cheerier than PERS. The, the, oh. the, the problem slightly. with the housing stuff that's getting crammed down from, from Sacramento is that they're trying to do this one-size-fits-all housing fix, right. and we don't have a housing crisis here. <coughs> taking away your, your yeah, it's, local it, authority. Yeah, it truly is taking away local authority for a lot of the things that we want to do. Um, and I think the, the craziest one we've seen so far is the one that if you're not meeting your rain in numbers, then you're not going to get SB1 funding. Which yeah. makes no sense. Uh, Madam Mayor, maybe I can also ask, uh, I think all of us received um, the invitation from the city of Yuma for their um, oh, yeah. economic right. summit. Uh, this is a follow up to the mayor's summit that was hosted by Mexicali uh, back a few months ago. And um, I, I will be attending, I will be, be representing both uh, the city of El Centro as well as um, IBC. And, and I was in talking to our city manager earlier, uh, uh, we also had committed to host uh, our a public safety summit yes. along the same lines. So we're hoping that by the time we go into this March 15th uh, mm -hmm. summit that we're able to provide the guests some definitive um, dates and, and yeah. agendas and all that yeah. kind of stuff. Uh, I know our you. mayor, you, you can't make it, Madam Mayor, I know. No, I, I will Cardenas be can. I'll be there. Calcon, so. We're gonna stay at the queue. No, it starts at 10. <laughs> 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 okay, I think we are adjourned. Casino in a bar. Oh.